All right, thanks very much. It's great to see you here. It's funny that me, as an old guy, is talking to the future about you, with you, uh, who are obviously a lot younger than I am. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, my original title for the presentation was The Future of Media and Advertising. But as I was working on this, I realized I'm just talking about the future. So I cut the title. And there's a few things that are entirely new in this presentation because as I was thinking about Google, the future of media, and so on, I changed a few things, and you'll see what that means pretty soon. So this is sort of the job that I'm doing. I'm putting together puzzles. Right? I help clients basically understand what's happening in the future and how to mix that with the present in terms of devising strategies and so on. And then, in a way... What are you going to do now? I going to go upstairs for a minute. Oh, I meant with your future. You're lying. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. You may know this scene from The Graduate when he's talking about the future. Of course, he's worried about being found out by the husband, but it's quite different. So I wrote a bunch of books. One is called The Future of Music in 2005, and very sadly, the book is still very accurate. Uh, I wrote a new book. <laughs> yeah, it's, kind of, it's really funny, but when you read the book, you're like, okay, this was four years ago. I can't believe it. My new book is Music 2.0. Uh, that came out in February. If you're interested, I have a few free copies. Uh, you can grab one later if you want. I also have free downloads at music20book.com. You can download the whole PDF uh, on a radio headlight model, which means pay nothing or pay everything as you see fit. My new book is coming out later this year. It's called The End of Control. It's not about music. It's about media and controlling the brand, how to make money when you lose control over distribution. These are my websites. I have various Twitter channels. This is one of them, the Daily Wisdoms channel, which gives you stuff I find on the web as a feat, like, you know, one-liner wisdoms. I can recommend that one. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're Twittering, that's, you know, if you want to waste more time, you can subscribe to that channel. Here's some of my clients. I've worked for record labels, publishers, advertising agencies, uh, cell phone companies, wireless networks, and so on. So it's pretty much all over the map with this. And uh, even this guy likes what I'm talking about. So he's giving me his blessings, which is a, a good thing. So really what I do in my life is sort of I'm a blender. Right? I take stuff from different directions. Clients take things from me. And we mix it up with uh, hopefully the outcome of being able to define the future. So here are some essential images. Right? This is the world that we live in. As I was Googling for change on Google, I found this. You see why in a minute. Don't worry, I'm not just showing you a train. There's other things here. So this is a street market scene from Bangkok, right? It shows you how basically the tr the railroad is transformed into a market now, you know, in a few seconds. Right? So, interestingly enough, you know, this is sort of the world that we're living in, right? The change is like imminent, right? It's everywhere. And if you were around, you know, I was around the, in the internet bubble in the late 90s. I ran a bunch of online music companies. We thought it was all going to happen right there and then, right? We were going to buy EMI, right? the end of the, of the 90s. Now these things are happening. It just took longer, but look at this, you know, now the private equity guys running EMI and pretty soon Sony BMG. So one of the big things that's happening is that we're now actually connected. We're starting to be connected, right? It's only maybe about two or three percent of the world is on broadband, right? Which isn't much. But connection is changing everything. I mean, it's basically creating a network of people, a network of users, and this whole thing where I think we're only in the beginning of understanding what it means to be connected. And this has input on everything, on advertising, on media, on communications. Right? Being connected is completely different. My son, who's 18, my other one is 13, they live in a completely connected world. They don't do emails, right? They leave messages, they send stuff back and forth, they swap stuff, they share things. Right? This is a completely different world. In a way, of course, it's the Google world, the world that Google has helped to bring about. So we're only sort of at the beginning of this iceberg. And when you realize this, you know, basically, I, when I was in Jakarta about uh, three weeks ago at a conference that I did there for broadband, they're putting entire world in Indonesia, 260 million people, 85% Muslims, putting them on a broadband wireless internet connection, 16,000 islands. 
Right? This kind of change that these people will have is huge. Right? The change from disconnected uh, to connected. So in a way, this is sort of a, a mock-up of a future world. You know, we're all connected. There's media in there, and there's lots of relationships. Right? As you know, I wouldn't go as far as calling it love, but you know, this is very, very important. This is about real relationships. Right? Not about like 10 years ago when we just are happy to email somebody. Right? This is a lot deeper than this. It's about real stuff. So a central shift is this huge paradigm shift from the sort of central role. This was like old media companies, right? We're in the middle of everything. We run everything. Right? Now you have this. So example for music, you know, going from the network to networked. Right? It's only a small difference, but the network being BBC or CBS or NBC, now it's about being networked. Right? It's a whole different cup of tea, again, being connected. Now, music, for example, looks like this. Rather than having the sort of central record company paradigm, now we got all these small companies creating the same thing, but through a network. Right? This is a co completely different way of looking at the music business. And basically, this is, a, again, the subject of my next book, this means the end of control, because in a central system, it's easy to control. The music industry controlled the artists, controlled the radio stations, controlled the retailer, controlled us watching it or listening to it. Today, Last FM gives us the tools, for example, to unplug them, right? at least to some degree. There will probably be new players here, but still. So if we look at this, you know, basically today you have this on the web, and every possible page has a share this button. Right? Pretty soon I'm going to wear a share this button. Right? Because it's all about sharing, forwarding, you know, bookmark this, do this. Right? This is the default setting of the web now. Right? This is basically a sharing and forwarding culture. Now, you may think this is trivial, right? because for you it means nothing. I mean, obviously, this is the world you live in. But for a lot of people, this is a completely different thing. Being able to share your playlists, your TV shows, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and even if you're drinking coffee with or without milk or not. You know, sharing stuff is a whole new experience for a lot of people. And wait till we have you know, a billion Indian people, Chinese people, Brazilians, Russians doing the same thing. Right? What do they do with media? Well, they become media in a way themselves through the process. Right? So this cow shows us aptly what's happening with the content industry. And the biggest thing that's happening here is the share this phenomena. Right? The web has enabled us to share. Just like we used to swap tapes, you know, when I was a kid, record the vinyl, record the radio, and then swap the tapes. You know, now we're doing the same thing on steroids. The iPhone is going to allow us to share a gigabyte of music in the subway with somebody. Right? This is just a question of getting the right plug-in. The same goes, of course, for other phones. So this whole idea of being able to sort of connect to others, right? This is completely unplugging the content industry scheme. Because that says, basically, you copy, you pay. Right? You listen on the radio, that's okay, you don't have to pay, you're just paying sort of inadvertently. Right? But if you copy, you have to pay with real money. So now we have a problem. And the copy uh, paradigm is that we should be paying every time we click, which, of course, is not very realistic. Right? So what do we do here? The content industries are in a real turmoil. How do they, how do they make money if they don't control distribution? if they don't control the copies, if they're being disrupted, that the copies are, in the essence, free. Last of M is making music free. Right. And so is every digital radio station and uh, you know, top100.cn in China very soon with music. So now, people are sort of subscribing to people. Uh, this is a whole different... Again, it's trivial for you because you do this every day. Right? But this is what's happening with uh, uh, friend feed and with Twitter, with everything. We're subscribing to friends, not just to this huge ocean of stuff. Right? This is the social part of media. And, of course, mass media is in there as well. So, you know, it's sort of a, uh, you know, you either engage today or you T-vote. In other words, you work with people to, to bring them in, to attract them as a content owner, or they just cut you out. This is what happened to New York Times, Britannica, Associated Press. Right? You have to be in there, otherwise you're sort of t vote and cut out. Right? Even if your content is inadvertently available as well. 
So the iPhone, again, is pointing this direction, and so are many other phones in this turf. <coughs> so in the old world, we had this kind of marketing. Some people even argue that marketing or advertising only existed because there was no internet. Right? You could argue that if I can make a connection with you, and you're all going to buy my book, and we can talk directly, why do I need to run an ad? Because if I have a network, the network will respond. Right? So I don't really need to do advertising if my brand, you know, Audi, BMW, whatever, is connected with the user. So this kind of thing in the past being more of a push mechanism. Push was very expensive. Again, with music, if you didn't have a million dollars to market a big artist, it just wouldn't work. Right? He needed the money. So this push is now becoming essentially a pull mechanism to where this is extremely hard to do when, you're not, when you don't know how to pull people when all you know is how to shout. So about 90% of the cases that I do in terms of the work that I do with companies, they're very good at shouting. Right? Monologues, messages, you know, top-down things. But to have a conversation, you know, that could be dangerous. Right? The band can't be controlled. So this is a big change. So we have this sort of ecosystem that's being turned around. This is not just about surge, about content, about copyright, about any of these things, right? These are all interconnected, all the way to food and energy. Right? Because obviously in this system, as we are connecting, we're creating a different ecosystem. Right? I mean, many things that we're doing here in technology and search and stuff is creating a new logic. What is the logic of YouTube? It's, it has nothing to do with television in terms of the logic, right? It's a whole different case. Music in the future will be essentially free. But not free in the sense of the art is not being paid. Free in the sense of me using it. Right? Compare it to water. When I go to the bathroom here, I don't have to put in my credit card to make it flush. Right? Why is that? Because Omid pays for the water. Google pays for the water. Somebody does. And somebody has paid thousands of pounds to run those pipes. I don't pay for the pipes. I assume that there are pipes. If I'm at home, I have a pool, I fill it up every day, I have to pay more for the water. But I do have water. So with music, we're still at that place where we're saying, well, if you want the pipe, it's a dollar. Right? If you want to connect to legal music, you've got to pay up. Right? This doesn't make any sense. The pipe should be there. The network is the pipe. The music has to be in the network. Everything else comes afterwards. So we'll talk more about that in a minute but I don't want to be too music-centric on this. So Now we have this latest development to where we can actually connect with friends and people. Right? This was a, you know, for the last two years from LinkedIn to Facebook to Twitter to, to uh, a friend, um, um, whatever. <laughs> this is Jaiku, I think. So we can actually connect with people. Now we have a river of stuff coming towards us. Right? It's getting to be so bad that we have lots and lots and lots of input. I mean, we have more input than ever before. Right? And everyone is different. Do you like an ocean of contacts, an ocean of information? I have 900-something RSS feeds. That pretty much qualifies me for the ocean. Do you want a lake? Do you want a stream, a creek, or a puddle? You know, which ones of these things do you want? What are you able to take? Right? This is completely different for each person. And culture. Right? When you take the tube in London, people read the newspaper. Some do SMS. You go to Korea, it's all electronic. No newspaper, no books, just all doing stuff. Right? Different cultures, different ways of using things. So in a way, you could argue that this sort of overwhelming part of technology and media right, is hitting all of us pretty hard because we have basically 1,500 messages per day that are reaching us in different ways. I think this is increasing. right? Of course, Twitter and Facebook and everything else is not exactly cutting back on these things. Right? Maybe cutting back on the email a little bit to some degree. So we have to deal with this idea of being you know, constantly reachable and constantly being pinged by people. And in many ways, you know, even in the 1600s, you know, this guy was already overwhelmed with his Mac and his phone and you know, saying, like, oh God, you know, how do I deal with this? Right? I mean, it's not like it's not possible, but it's certainly not easy. So, what we need is filters, right? Meaning filters, context. 
Like 62 million songs are available. Do I want to download all of them just because I may be interested at some time down the road? Well, I have news for you. Of course, kids are not even downloading anymore, right? You have to, you have to qualify for the free download. In other words, you have to pay to get the free download. Right? So, in many ways, it's essentially the filter, the recommendation, the context that creates the value, not just the content itself. So, to get these filters to spin and to be meaningful is quite something that I think we can see in the evolution of the web. You know, Web 1.0 was really all about getting the noise. This was MP3.com and SonicNet and real networks, you know, just noise, 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 get as much as you can. Just having it available was a big deal. Web 2.0 was about making the noise, or is about making the noise. You know, blogs, publishing stuff, self-publishing, all these things that are happening on the web. And then Web 3.0 is sort of, that's the filtering idea. Right? If you want to check out a gold filter, go to the filter.com. It's Peter Gabriel's project. Quite interesting about recommendation on a higher scale. I think, you know, if there is any such thing as Web 4.0, you know, we can go on till 100 here. It's really about smart noise. Right? It's about finding a way to get exactly the noise that I want. And why do I care about somebody else's playlist if it's not relevant to me? Somebody else's search results, somebody else's tags or bookmarks, right? It's all about finding a match, finding and being found. <laughs> so, smart noise, you know, if you're looking at this sort of context, you know, if you were saying, okay, you know, what what was I working on again? The New York Times made this research about how people are interrupted. It shows that interruption is a huge issue, right? 28% of people says, you have to say there's interruptions of things that aren't urgent or important. Right? How do I bring down this noise to meaning? Right? How do I go somewhere and basically have meaning sort no, of built in? The and then we're here. Right? We're at this place. From well, I think the Minority Report is this. Where is the Matrix? The Minority Report. You can move the old fashioned John Astor. To where you're identified by wearing something that tells people who you are and what you do. It synchronizes the ads as you walk by. This is already reality. It creates the window as you walk by by what kind of art fit you carry. Right? What kind of location device you... Right? It basically identifies people. Very scary thought, of course, for most of us. But not for all of us. Right? Being able to identify not only the uh, retina scan, but electronic devices that talk to others. You know, the constantly sort of meshed network idea. And this goes on you know, into products. You know, becoming personally identifiable, for example, uh, again in, in uh, Japan, is the quick response code for the mobile. Here you can hold it up to a product and you can, get, and you can find out how many calories the burger has. Right. Believe it or not, this is already working for people. Right. In Miami, you can go to a club and people wear t-shirts with a quick response code. You can click on it and the screen shows you how old, you know, what kind of relationship, what kind of sex you want. You know. yeah. I, that's rather explicit, you would say. right? And then people can actually order drinks with an embedded RFID chip in their, in their arm. Right? So you don't have to bring your wallet. That's perfect if you're naked, for example. So there, you know, that's already happening. A lot of these things are very scary, but this is really a cultural question. This is not about technology. Do I want to share information? Do I want other people to track me? Do I want this sort of transparency? This is a huge cultural issue. It's not a technology issue. And I think this is something we have to keep in mind when we plan products. You know, what does it do? What is the fact that Gmail reads my mail? Right? As long as I'm not worried about where that goes, you know, I, I'm fine with that. But what does it do in terms of culture? Right? What is the next step? So this sort of syndrome, you know, we're seeing this increasingly around the world. People, especially in the UK, I think what's the average time you get filmed in London is like 550 times a day. Right? So that worries people. And this idea of brands monitoring you and stuff, I think that's also a very big concern, becoming transparent you know, in this sort of system, you know, going back to this. So Walter Mosberg from the Wall Street Journal, he says, the Internet is a grid, going back to the matrix, and we're all going to be living on it and carrying it in our pocket at all times. Now think about what I said earlier about connect and disconnect. This makes a huge difference. 
for a lot of things, for the good and for the bad. Right? But this changes advertising because basically if we do this, we don't need old style advertising. It's not of any use to us because it's not a value. We can bypass it. So this is from a mailing list I subscribe to. I won't tell you which, but you know, it's funny. I picked this up yesterday just fishing around for Google. Right? So this whole thing about YouTube sharing data with Viacom, I'm sure you're tracking some of these conversations, right? They said in the mailbox, it says, by retaining the data in the first place, Google destroyed the privacy of millions. Right? These are messages you can find all over the web. This issue of privacy, of course, as I'm sure you know, is the major issue going forward. It's a bit of a chicken and the egg. Right? Because what happens if you don't get people's data? You can't do anything with them. If this remains a dumb network, you can't sell anything. Right? Advertising relies on the data being synchronized. The more I tell you about me, the better you can pitch me, just like real life. Right? So if this doesn't happen, you, you don't get the data of the user, you have nothing. The AdWords are toast, right? because you, you can't synchronize. So that is the chicken and the egg. You need the data. How do you get it? How does the user feel about this? So, looking at this a little bit further, you know, there's this guy, Henry Jenkins at MIT. You should read his book, too, Convergence Culture. A very smart guy. He says it's really not about technologies, but about emerging cultural practices. Right? Today, you could almost summarize that business really is about capturing the emerging cultural things that are happening. Right? Taking in the opportunity from this viewpoint is not entirely based on just cool technology that's available. So if you take a, this sort of a view of culture being a central thing, broadband culture, connected culture, you, you get to this point for, uh, where you say, okay, basically what we have here is a new cultural economy. This is the title of an event I'm doing in, uh, in Austria at this interactive festival uh, in September. That's the title of the event, which I pirated, obviously. But So in this new cultural economy, what's happening here? What's the value? Who owns what we create? Who has the right to copy it? Who has the right to broadcast it? Who has the right of attention? And these are serious questions. You know, who owns culture? Disney? Sony BMG? Motown Records? You know, who owns what people create, right? Who owns culture? And what is culture? I mean, who is a creator and who is not? And who owns content? I mean, Google, of course, everything you do refers to content in some place, whether it's a blog search, or news, right? Content, content, content. That's really what the whole system lives on. So who owns content? Crucial question. A bunch of crucial questions. What is a copy? What is fair use? What is a use to begin with? Right? When you're listening, is that a use or is it a copy? Right? When you're reading something, are you sucking it up and making a mental copy and, and then writing a book on it? Are you stealing something? I mean, the argument of the Associated Press against the bloggers just four weeks ago, right? Essentially saying, is if you copy more than like one sentence or certain sentence, you know, then you're guilty and then here you're not. I mean, you have to wonder where they live, what kind of world they live in, you know? Do we have those fences? I mean, I don't see them, but... So, what is an author? In music, for example, the principal right of the creator says, I have the right to forbid you to make a copy. That's the law. Right? The law says, I have the exclusive right. Well, the law also said, I have the exclusive right of my property all the way up to the moon. And if you fly the plane above my property, you can't do it. So American Farmers 1945 sued. Right? This is the example from Larry Lessig, where he said that they sued against the airplanes flying over the farm. Because it's their property. Right? Well, of course, it was government airplanes, so yeah, that's a... That's kind of a weak position. But anyway, the government said, oh, that's, that's fine you know, in principle, you're right, but if we allow this, we can't have airplanes. We're in exactly the same position with music copyrights. right? If we allow the exclusive right of the creator to prevail in this way, we can't do this. Right? The copyright can prohibit basically anything. All the cool stuff on the web is illegal. Mux tape, songs are project playlist, I mean, hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of cool stuff that probably all of you are doing. Not even going anywhere near file sharing, right? Or Gmail box sharing or, you know, thousands of things. So, 
we have to get used to a new definition of what this means, a new kind of usage, right, which I'll talk about in a second. But this is just to flag some of those issues. So now, of course, in addition to this, we also have the situation where each culture is different. I want to just show you this video to illustrate how different cultures are. It's a good German, you know, you can see how he parked. In Germany, cars are a great source of pride. And any accident, no matter how minor, is always taken very seriously. However, just across the border in France, there's a more we make this carefree line? approach. HSBC never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. HSBC, the world's local bank. So HSBC made some pretty cool ads about this whole thing, right? But now let's zoom back and say, okay, this local difference is obviously, you know, that's extremely important in this whole debate. Hollywood, right? The dominance of Hollywood is winding down because quite simply, we get other places, right? They are cranking out 7,200 major motion pictures a year. Hollywood would next 300. Right? These films are widely available in all different forms and shapes. Right? They don't have the sort of ownership model that they have in Hollywood. So what is happening worldwide is that the market share of Hollywood products is declining. Right? Just like English language on the web, as I'm sure you know, has declined from 70% to 36%. Right? Because now we have other options, and we need those options, right? So Hollywood in itself isn't going to be that sort of major make it or break it. You know, do you have, uh, you know, some movie or don't you have it? It's basically, if you're looking at this population growth chart, you know, where's the growth, you know, obviously in the developing countries? Right, so what does that mean for content? I think ultimately that means we cannot assume that our way of dealing with content, the value attached to a copy, the value attached to copyright, as such, is going to prevail here. It's not going to work. Right? Indians aren't going to buy, you know, uh, 30 rupees a piece on iTunes songs. Right? It's just not going to happen. Right? This is obviously the leaning towards more of a flat rate access approach, right? Basically a bundled situation, right? Which doesn't do away with copyright, but it, it establishes a new type of usage, right? So this dude, Medvedev, the Russian, the Russian president, I was fortunate enough to be at a, a place in St. Petersburg called the International Economic <laughs> Forum, where I had a speech about the future of copyright. And I listened to his speech uh, in the morning. It was quite interesting. He was talking about economic egoism. Sounds very communist, of course. <laughs> 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 Funnily enough, you know, he was quite right on. There were about 3,000 people listening to his speech. And, and um, so basically what he meant that economic egoism meant until now, if you saw a market opportunity as a company, if it was open, if the market allowed you to move, you would move and you'd market the hell out of it. you just do whatever you can to make money. And that was okay. Right? You know that the Indians want to smoke, so you do advertising for smoking. Right? You know Chinese people want cars, you make ads for cars and they buy cars. Right? You don't care about the streets having issues or you know, greenhouse effect or whatever you have. Right? You basically take the market opportunity. So the major TV studios have said to Russia, if you don't wipe out the piracy and all the free stuff, you're not going to be part of the club that gets enough money for the harvest or for machines or development. It's as simple as that. Right? Very straightforward economic issues. Because now we're in this place where this doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't it work? Because we're connected. Everything we do in one place connects to something somewhere else. So the record label is not providing a license to the likes of Napster, you know, 10 years ago, or the likes of Last FM, as of just last year, or MySpace, or YouTube for that matter, has a ripple effect. Right? It's not just that they can do it, because of, of course they are entitled to do it, they have every right by law to do so, but does it make it right? Methodist argument says it's not. Because it creates a situation, for example, in the record labels where thousands of companies are illegal or they cease to exist. They either stop doing what they're doing or they uh, adhere to, to the demands and they crash. 
I mean, you see this all the time. So this kind of thing is a major change in terms of the business paradigm that we're seeing everywhere, especially in media. So this sort of smashing up with this idea of economic egoism is what we're seeing in the future. And, and this sort of paradigm, especially in the media business, the New York Times, right? The, the labels, the studios, and of course lots of mobile networks, my way or the highway. Right? We basically run this place and we can do this because we can. So you better come in with us or not. Right? So we're basically moving to this paradigm. Right? While they're creating something together, because if we don't do it together, it won't happen. Right? This is the kind of ecosystem I'm, I'm sure Google is looking to build, right? because it's a mutual effect of making money. It's not a one-way effect of making money, which means you, know, you, you lose, I win. Right? But explain that to people. Right? This is why my, my next book, The End of Control, is pointing the finger towards those issues of control. Right? If you prefer control over money, then continue on your merry way. Right? You won't be making the new money. Because it doesn't work that way. I mean, in this system, we're essentially creating the new ecosystem that's connected. Right? This is an entirely different logic of how business works, of how media works, of how sharing works. So, in this case, really, trust is the key. Right? This sounds sort of California hippie, you know. Like Paul McGinnis said, you know, the manager of U2 said... Uh, you know, in a speech about piracy and the internet service providers, he said that these people in California, meaning you know Google and others, right, have these California geek hippie dreams about sharing and all this stuff, and this all bullshit. They should just go to jail. Right? So I think if you're looking at successful companies, trust is totally the key. Right? This is not some pipe dream. Right? You have to earn it, maintain it, keep it. Right? Look at the Nine Inch Nails. Right? They trusted the audience to say they are so interested, the download is free, and this thing, the $300 Ultra Deluxe Limited Edition, was sold out in four hours. Right? Because they trusted the audience, like the Grateful Dead 30 years ago, right? to say, take the music, if you like me, you'll give me more money. And right? of course, they're in a position to do it, you know, that's not everybody can do this. Right? So, we have a survey from Edelman Consulting, so PR agency, right? They said that 55% of people would take direct action against the company if they objected to its practices. 53% would share negative opinions and 46 would ignore them. Right? This is your punishment for distrust. And guess what? Who is the most distrusted company in the world? Uh, the Recording Industry Association. I don't mean to harm them. They're just an exceptional case of stupidity. <laughs> but there's many others. Right? If you go down this road of enforcing control, you're in deep trouble. Especially if there's nothing to enforce. Right? If you're just sort of saying, okay, I, I really would like this too. And, you know, it's, that is not the reality. So we have these issues to where this is sort of evaporating. We have trends that we're seeing everywhere. Multilateral consideration versus egoism. That means a company that has a business idea has to consider what's around the execution of this idea. What happens if we do this? Who else is impacted? Is it just about me rolling out you know, two billion new cars into China? Because I can? Or is there other effects? Who's going to make money in the long run? Can we share and collaborate versus walling off? This is the great paradigm for the mobile networks, right? They weren't interested in that until just you know, a year ago. All of a sudden, they're all interested in sharing collaboration. Right? All of a sudden, Nokia says you know, it's all about sharing and openness. And you know, Of course, from their viewpoint, it has always been to some degree. But so walling stuff off is not a good idea anymore. Collaborative competition. Sounds like a dichotomy, of course. They're actually working together to achieve stuff. Skillfully open. Google is a great example. People think of Google as an open company. But of course, I can't see your source code. Not that I would want to. Right? So there is a certain skill of, see, of keeping some away and keeping some open. It's not an either-or scenario. Right? It's a scale. Transparent versus secretive. Trust and merit versus control. Right? These kind of paradigms you can see popping up everywhere. Now, what happens with advertising here is that basically advertising as we know it is toast. If you apply any of these things, we don't want advertising. None of these things can be achieved with advertising, with the advertising that we know. 
right? I mean, adverbs aren't obtrusive, but do they create value? I mean, they may, but in general, you know, what is an ad? Right? Trying to capture my attention. So I'll talk about this in the next slide, but let's sort of summarize. I found this somewhere on the web last night. Quite interesting. This person says, why is Google, why do they insist the goal is to organize the world's information? Because markets, <coughs> networks, and communities can organize economic activities radically more efficient than firms. Think of this paradigm, what this means. Right? That the collaboration, the working together, can be more efficient than one firm doing it. In the pharma business, this is already happening. It used to be three or 400 researchers spending $600 million to build the next superpower pill. Now it's 17,000 people collaborating on wikis. Right? British Telecom has 16,000 people blogging internally. Right? IBM has a network called, I think it's called Bumblebee. Right? 30,000 people on wikis right? collaborating. So that is the power of collaboration that we're seeing from here. And of course now, if you're looking at this sort of being a trust issue, you know, I, I got a couple of quotes, you know, which I thought were kind of interesting, right? Pittman says, Google Labs will become more transparent in its interaction with the end users. This was just from yesterday. I had sort of quoting on this. And this is the other one that was quite interesting from um, Marisa saying, trust is the basis of everything we do. Right? As I was fishing for trust in Google, I found this on Google. So... We want you to be familiar and comfortable with the integrity and care we're giving your personal data. This is the key issue, not just for Google, but for everyone else. Huh? People feel comfortable how you use their data. There are some calculations that an active music user is worth a thousand euros a year by the data that he creates, by the sharing, the tagging, the rating. Right? If Last.fm can get each of the users to be worth a thousand euros to advertisers and brands, They'll be bigger than Viacom, right? And of course, that's the CBS idea. Right? Can we use the data that's created around the content to extract value from it? Which, of course, is a trust issue. So, let's get down to the bottom line. Control. You've seen this all over the web now. Right? We're sorry is no longer available. The control key has been pushed. So, now we have the New York Times. Right? Just to, as an as a antidote to this, a few months ago they said, everyone can now have access to our archives. Right? They're paying the reporters $400,000 a year, hundreds of them, to be extra smart, investigate stuff, and dish it up to us. And they've been doing that for, what, 100 years, right? So when their web came along, they said, there's no way we're going to just make this all available. Right? Just no, we can't do that. There's no ours feeds, no, no inside of the times, right? So they came up with Time Select, right, which was an access-based model. Fifty-nine dollars. I was once stupid enough to actually pay for it. Um, so there's 257,000 people, including myself, that paid for it. Right? Congratulations! The New York Times, the biggest newspaper in the world, got 12 million dollars. Right? Wow, fantastic, right? This is an utter disaster, of course, compared to what they could be doing because also their relevance on the web just completely skyrocketed, just blew up, right? Because they couldn't link to them. So six months ago, they said, okay, now everybody can do it. And of course, what's the argument? As search becomes more dominant, we took down the paywall and sold advertising. Wow. That's good, right? I mean, of course, selling advertising turns out it's not quite as easy as it looks, right? Because advertising on the web has to be different. Advertising in the connected world has to be radically different. Otherwise, it will keep declining in value. Right? This is not the same thing. So, very good example from the New York Times where they said, okay, now that we do this, we also have to keep on thinking up new things, right? So now they put bloggers on the homepage and the time machine allows you, like the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive, allows you to pull up the actual print editions on the web and browse them. Right? So they got the idea oh, to create more pull, we have to create more value. Right? This is happening in every single media company in the world. Television, radio, book publishing, magazines. Right? Attract people, pull them, add more value, sell stuff around it. The Britannica. Great story, right? 
Look at the graph I got from uh, from uh, Wiki, Wikinomics. Right, the blue line is Wikipedia, and the red line is, doesn't even exist as a Britannica in terms of web views. Right. So now, after 10 years of this, I said, okay, never mind. We're giving away subscriptions. The Britannica emailed me, right, a useless blogger, emailed me to say, do you want to try Britannica online for free? Just three months ago, which I thought was great. So I did, and I'm trying it. Won't comment any more on this. But now they're saying, why are you doing this? Well, we'd like more people to see it and talk about it. Wow, what a realization after 10 years, right? They'd like more people to see it. Right? So, so now you have to give it to them. I mean, this is a, a pretty big admission. Right? You wish the movie studios, the record companies, would have the same admission and say, we'd like more people to hear our music. Imagine that. Imagine that I could type in the name of an artist on Google and just listen to it. Right? That would be, I mean, technically speaking, it's nothing. Right? But that would be great because more people would hear it. Right? What do you want for your artists from your content? Do you want to be heard? So now they're also saying, are you giving the money away with all the free stuff? And they're saying, no, we don't think so. On the contrary, people using our products will subscribe more. This is the logic we arrived to after 10 years. This is why you need some futurists to tell you about where it could go. So again, a bit of the end of the control here. And then now we're looking at this thing as the next step, right? The Kindle, e-paper, fuel cells, right? Five years from now, huge shift in the publishing industry. Right? When we have this, it's just now starting. RSS feeds of books, news, personal net vibes type pages, Google Reader, everywhere in the world, updating your own electronic paper. Right? What will this do with the publisher? I think this is where it goes back to economic egoism. My vision is that people at Google would figure out a way to make this whole ecosystem stronger. Right? And that is a complex, complex task right? because these guys don't know how to do that. Right? They're still dumbfounded. So the challenge for content owners now is to make money around the content. Think of a book. Right? You buy a book, it's 10 quid, there's no ads in sight. There's no connectivity, it's just, a, just pure content. It's essentially a penalty for the interface, you know, for, the, for the print. Okay? You buy a CD, it's the same thing. You know, it's just the music for the most part. Now this is happening, you get all these digital products, everything around it matters. The bottom line is, I wrote this myself, content used to be 100% paid for, and now it's not. Right? Now we must put content in the middle and create everything around it. Right? That's what the record companies call, for example, a 360 deal. Right? trying to get the artists to do all of those things like advertising, sponsorship, get part of the tour money and all these things. That's happening everywhere, starting from Robbie Williams and others. Again, going back to emerging cultural practices. What is the value of an artist, of a song, of a motion picture? Is not the copy of the zeros and ones. It's the experience. Right? It's the connection. Right? It's the real meaning of the artist. And there's hundreds of things around this, including, as is common practice in China, Every single band has a corporate sponsor. Right? That's how it works in China. A band says, we like your music, we'll put you up at a party, but we'll also fund, fund your tour. Right? That's also how it works in Africa. So, this sort of view of the future right, is based, you know, the, if we look at the past, the sort of scarcity stuff that we had to deal with. Right? There's only 25 radio stations or so you can possibly have on the dial in the past. Right? There's only a certain amount of stuff you can ship around the world. There's a certain amount of airwaves, CDs, uh, record stores, TV channels, bookshelves, and so on. Right? Now the future basically kills the scarcity idea. Right? We don't, we're no longer scarce. I mean, all this stuff is there. Unless it's like a statue or something. Right? It's there. So we're moving into sort of an unlimited world. How can you expect the business model from the limited scarcity world to work in this world? You can't. You need an entirely new value model. The value of copyright is to say, you make a copy, you pay me. That worked just fine if I have a way to prevent it. In this world, I don't. It's unlimited. So, what's happening here with this titanic of control is that it's very quickly sinking. Right? And basically what we're seeing is sort of a flatlining of control. 
Right? And that means that we have to look urgently for models that are based on trust and merit and quality rather than controlling of an ecosystem. And for many brands and advertisers, it's a major problem. Right? We don't want you messing with our video that we have paid half a million dollars to produce and, and promote you know, the, the quality of our product. We don't want you remixing that and putting stuff over it. Right? We want to run the brand. Right. Now the marketing offices of major brands are all thinking in the other direction. They're saying, what can we do to engage the users to pull them in rather than to shout at them, which means that we're sort of losing control to a large degree, moving on to a different paradigm. Right. This is a letter that you may be getting from Virgin Media if you're unfortunate enough to be a subscriber. <laughs> yeah. right. They said, if you don't read this, your broadband could be disconnected. Right. Because you may be one of those people that is downloading stuff without permission. Right? We unplug you. And we take the plug out if you're lousy, if you're not a good citizen. Right? If you don't ask for permission. And then the next letter is going to say, if you download these PDFs, you, you, you're going to be unplugged. And the next one is going to be, you read the wrong thing, we'll unplug you. Right? I mean, this is a very interesting development. The idea behind this is to say that you know, we still control the ecosystem <clears throat> rather than to say you know, we give permission. A hundred years ago, radio was illegal. Well, in the, in the UK, many stations, including Radio London and other ones, were out the channel broadcasting. Right? Those were pirate stations. If you want to read a good book about this, read The Pirate's Dilemma by Matt Mason. It's a great book, a friend of mine who wrote it. Um, so, a hundred years ago, radio was illegal. Right? And to, the, uh, uh, the record companies and artists and publishers said, we won't, we won't give you permission to do this because it destroys our logic. People won't go to a concert when they can hear it on a radio. Right? So that's not good. Today, I think we're in the same place. It took 20 years to get a license for radio. Right? I think in the next two years, we will have a flat rate, a bundled license for the use of music on the web. That means as soon as you connect, you're legal. You're blessed to do as you see fit just like radio. Nobody has to watch out what they listen to on radio or who they dial up to. So the end of control as we knew it is coming. It's a huge paradigm shift. It's from the total control paradigm to the total empowerment. Again, it sounds a bit sort of California, but you know, when you think about the most powerful thing that can happen is to empower the user to do these things and find a way to ex extract value from them. So it's no longer about the certified and sort of central authority the select few authorized professionals, they will, of course, continue. There's no doubt about that. But it's also about the combined power of masses of people. In advertising, you're already finding that brands are trying to talk to the consumers about the next campaign. Brands are even trying to talk to consumers about the next car they should be building. They're trying to make a direct connection between the people who are actually the users. In music, of course, that's completely evident. And lastly, again, going back to Medvedev, it's no longer about just actions guiding, guided by your own concerns, but also by others and by the value of the network. So going back to this key work of the new sort of cultural economy, right, I think this is something we are building, of course, very much here, of course, in the next couple of years. Right? There's lots of stuff to be figured out. How does it work? How does it relate? One thing is for sure, digital content is not the same as a chair or a television or a car. Right? The same logic does not apply. Whoever says stealing music, in parentheses on the web, is the same than going to a record store and stealing one, does not use email. Right? Because the logic doesn't apply here. This is not entirely the same thing. Ownership enforcement now is a lot less important than usage permission. Right? When radio was licensed, licensed it turned from a zero business to an $18 billion business in the U.S. within two years. Imagine what would happen if the music companies and studios would give Google permission to share revenues for the free use of content on search. How much money could you generate from this? Right? What Baidu was doing for free in China, right? and therefore being the market leader. Right? Giving permission for the use of content is really the very first step. And interestingly enough now, you know, with the advent of all the web streaming, including now uh, films and videos, listening and viewing now really is copying. Right? 
Anybody who says that listening to music on Last FM or any sort of on-demand service is not the same than iTunes, right? Well, yes, if you're not connected, it's not the same, right? But since most people are not always connected, and especially in the future, what's the argument? Why is that different? And ultimately, you could even argue that searching is getting. Right? I mean, that's in the case of Baidu, that's actually true. Right? But as soon as you can search, you have access. So what is the logic? You know, how does this work? Value can no longer be defined by unit sales, for example, of records of DVDs. So we, here we have BPI chief Jeff Taylor saying a couple of days ago, and this is very interesting, I think, in the context of our discussion here, uh, the BPI is the British phonographic industry running the, you know, the lobby for the major labels. He says, we don't believe that society can allow the free consumption of content to persist. Wow, that's quite a statement, right? I don't know, do we, do we have control over the free <laughs> consumption of content? You know, is there any way that we cannot allow it? Right? Yes, it may not be legal, but in reality, can we not allow it? Can we resist? Can we refuse? Right? Can this license be refused? Ultimately, I don't think so. These mechanisms are available. In your mind, you can refuse, but you have to find a way to actually empower it and make money of it. So they remind me of a bike, you know, that's driven with with, with square wheels, right? It's like this is not going to go anywhere like this. Right? So here we have a 1925 record company guy saying the public will not buy songs that it can hear almost at will by a brief manipulation of the radio dials. Right. Now, radio turned out to be the biggest, uh, the biggest innovation in the music business for 50 years, right, right after this. Right. The same exact argument applies to the Internet now. Right. The public will not buy music that can be achieved by a brief manipulation of Google. Right. And think about that argument, same argument, basically. If you can find it, you have access, you're not going to do XYZ, which used to pay money. Right. What happened with radio is that people listened to radio and they said, oh, wow, this is a good thing. I should go to the gig. I should buy a T-shirt. Right. I should download the music. Right. We have exactly the same logic here. So the old toll booth, especially music, was like this. Okay, You got the music, you have uh, some sort of device carrying it, and there's a toll booth. Right. You have to go to the toll booth. iTunes, one pound, whatever. Right. And boom, you got the money. Right? The new logic is like this. You have a network. A network could not just be the network itself, like wireless or ISPs, but also network like social networks, social media, and of course search engines. Right? The music is in the network, put in by people that are on the network. And the toll booth are also in the network, right? meaning that when you access it's already paid for. Right? In other words, the value that you create as a user creates payment mechanisms of various kinds, not just advertising. Upselling, commissions, referrals, all kinds of things that, of course, are your daily job to figure out how to do this. Right? This kind of thing creates what we call the pool of money. Right? So the idea is essentially a flat-rated approach to this to this content issue, I think that's what we're going to see in the future. And now we have to ask, of course, the question, so what is content, really? I mean, is it just a copy of a professional production, some certain creator? Let's redefine it, okay? Text, music, audio, images, video, and of course, you know, that's the central sort of copyright paradigm. These are owned by people, right? That was the old sort of idea. I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying what is the practical approach to this now is that we have to be a little bit looser on this. Right? Because if we just consider this content, we have a problem with the people formerly known as the audience. Right? Because they don't think of it this way. Right? They're remixing, they're recombining, they're doing their own stuff, they're publishing stuff that may be some copied, some not. Right? This paradigm is very hard to enforce now because these people are now engaging. Right? So we have to think of this a little bit differently. We have to look at all the stuff around the content. Text, rating, packages, skins, usage history, all the stuff that I could call meta-content if I want to be using geek speak. Right? Data, essentially. Right? Now this kind of thing creates a wider context of what I would call content. 
right? That creates the value to the original producer of a song or a motion picture or whatever idea, right? This is a view that I think a lot of people are coming around to. Right? The users themselves are creating content in the use of this content. All of this really is content. So we have this evaporating distinctions, you know, the creator and the non-creator, the professional, the non, and the amateur, right? I mean, these are very sort of artificial distinctions that we can't really afford anymore to think of it like this. Is a blogger a professional, or when does he cease to be an amateur? Right? The same goes for musicians. Is a guy who, who does, doing cutting and pasting, is that a musician? Right? Or is it a cutting and pasting artist? Yeah. Now all of us are really both. And I think this is going to be a trend that is going to absolutely explode with the use of mobile devices. Okay. Because then we can do it on the fly and quickly. So content 2.0 is sort of a two-way conversation. That's already here. I mean, if you're looking at what's happening with the contribution of content, user ratings and reviews, customer testimonials, discussion boards, right? The user is already creating this content. Okay. If you can capture some of this, which you already are doing, of course, I think then you're in a pretty good position. So I've looked at Google. I found this somewhere on the web. I forgot where. But these are the growth rates for Google for last year. Um, I'm sure you're more familiar with that than I am. But you know, I Google, of course, exploding and a bunch of other things. So I've looked at this and said, OK, what has to do with content, right? right of course, video search, blog search, web search. And these are all content-related things, right? These are all based on the blog search, of course, the maps, right? I, Google, and everything is based on content. Okay. How, how do you, you hypothesize the others don't have any content? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, it's probably incomplete. You know, I, my, my point is that everything you do here is based on content. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think you're right on that. It's probably, I mean, Google Talk is not so much about content in that sense. But to some degree, also, of course, you What's could call the that. What's distinction you're making between content and inventory? Good question. No, I'm not really making any distinction. I think you you're pointing out a good point. You know, this is all about content. Product, product search inventory. Yeah. Product search inventory. Yeah, it depends again how you define content. But you know, ultimately, my point is that if you're looking at content as being the central point, I think figuring out the ecosystem around content, as I was pointing out earlier, is a crucial job, right? Because I think many content producers themselves will expand into becoming context providers, like lots of them as curators, aggregators, and packages. For example, what will happen with radio? Radio stations will become curators of content, like they already are, but they won't be insisting you listen at a certain time or on a certain frequency. Right? A lot of people like record companies, labels, publishers, they will provide a context, they will do packaging, they'll provide all these things to add value to the, uh, to the sort of curation process by doing all these things. I, I already wrote about this like three months ago. I think lots of blogs will essentially become record companies. Hype Machine, Pitchfork, Elbows, you know, all these companies are essentially the next Radio 1. Right? They're writing reviews and putting up the music. Right. Think of that in a larger context, especially on mobile networks. You have a radio station. So if that is content, what is advertising? If we define content in a wider field, right, like we have you know, using meta content and data, what is advertising? I think we have to hit the reset button as far as advertising is concerned. Right. I think we need to look at a larger f context of this. Uh, I think the Internet is essentially forcing us to reinvent advertising. And I think this is a very large mission. We're talking about $700 billion a year, right? And right now, maybe 10% of, of that is digital interactive, right? So it's a, this is a big job. If you're looking where this is leading us to, I think advertising is really publishing. Basically, publishing something that promotes a product or a service is getting to be almost the same than creating publishing products for entertainment purposes. Great example is BMWfilms.com. You, you may be familiar with in 2004 or five, I think it was, where BMW made uh, spent about 65 million dollars on making movies with James Brown and a bunch of other guys right, in the U.S. and they sold 15 percent more cars from these movies. They didn't even have a single logo of BMW. Right? Essentially, published something 
that promoted the brand in some way. I think this is a, a very, very large realization that with publishing, you know, getting users to pay attention in return for getting free content. First step, I think, in the next 12 to 18 months, music will be free, supported by people paying attention to some branded content or advertising, if you wish. But not advertising that disrupts, but valuable advertising. In other words, rather than paying for iTunes, I'm going to say, well, here's my profile. I may be looking to buy a car this year. I may be looking to do a cruise ship trip. You can send me something that's an exact fit with my profile, and advertisers will essentially pay for the music. I mean, in a way, that's not really new because radio is the same model, right? So this is where we're heading, and that goes with the flat radio. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, Orange and Friends announced that you can have the Orange Music Package and All You Can Eat package for 12 euros. The next step is to have the 12 euros paid by a brand. So music feels like free. This is the way we're heading also first with music, then with film and television content. Yes, we have to wrap up. Um, so I think the key to the future of advertising, I think, is the sort of right blend of sharing versus privacy, which is, of course, a cultural thing, a local thing. You know, if you have people like this, they're not very good for advertising right, because they are sort of protected. People like this would also be a problem. But I think explicit permission to temporarily and safely use the data, I think that's where we're going. And this is a very uh, a huge subject, I think, that lots of people are looking to solve. Um, if you look at the site Telco 2.2.0, you can see some of the trends towards using the data. I recommend you download some of those slideshows. You may have seen Telco 2.0.net. It's uh, some very good data on this. So I have to su summarize this. I think the bottom line is I think media and content is in the network, and so must be the advertising. Right? In other words, it doesn't do us very good to disconnect the advertising from the content in this way. I have one more slide I need to show. Just walk over here for a second, and then we're done. Uh, if we can, we can take some questions, but as you can see, I had various few other things here. So I'll give you a, a quick summary, and then we're there. I think, uh, just to summarize, I think you know, economic egoism is what I say is very much 1.0. Right. It's sort of the past, right? Doesn't really work any longer. I think we're just now seeing that coming into fruition also with the global crisis in energy and food. Right? It's very much related. Data is content is king. If I can mix it up like this, right? it's not just the original content. Advertising is publishing. Feels like free content is what we're getting. That's already here. And trust is the number one mission across the board. You can download this presentation, by the way. I'll put it on later on the web today at mediafuturist.com. There's many other ones too, but you can get this one. And relevance over quality. And lastly, of course, i got to say this. I think the end of control is shaping up everywhere. This is a very, very large shift that we're seeing in the sort of connected ecosystem. Thanks very much for listening. And I, don't, I want to uh, tell you also not to uh, forget to escape occasionally, like this key is doing. And this is where you can reach me via email or on the web. Thanks for listening. I have some books here. Just take a book if you would like one of those music books. So, uh, if you got the interest in